falling faster than a speeding bullet. Hitting the ground with four pounds in a locomotive. Able to jump off buildings in a single bound. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's the David family. Lifted him up and dropped them over. Then the last person paused for a while and then went, just went over the edge. I kept yelling, oh God, stop him, stop him. But then we, we, could, we could see some uh, observers up on the platform there. All were members of the Emanuel David family. The father, Emanuel, committed suicide by asphyxiation Monday. His body was found yesterday in a pickup parked up a canyon. When deputies last night told his wife, Rachel, about the suicide, she said it didn't surprise her that her husband had said he was ready for the next world. Emmanuel considered himself the true prophet, the Messiah, God. His family and a few close friends believed him. This morning, the mother and the three children who voluntarily jumped apparently decided to join him in the next world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Charles Bruce Longo was born in Yonkers, New York on November 9, 1938. Bruce was described as striking and handsome as a young man. He was not very athletic, but fun, loving, and active. But his mother described him as self-centered, as he thought he was better than others because his dad was a wealthy doctor. Bruce went to Gorton High School, and after graduating in 1955, he enlisted in the Marine Corps. But while in the service, he became friends with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and began attending services with them. In 1958, he returned to Yonkers, where he was baptized as a member of the church. He served in the LDS church-run version of the Boy Scouts, where he was a strong influence on the young people. In 1960, Bruce was called to serve a two-year mission to Uruguay. Bruce funded the mission himself. It was while on his mission that the first inklings of mental instability began to surface. It is not uncommon for symptoms to show in someone that already has a propensity for mental illness while they're serving a mission. He was hearing voices and told church officials that he had planned to become an apostle. Despite the onset of mental illness, he was able to memorize the Book of Mormon, the LDS Church Companion Scriptures to the Bible, and he was described as a zealot that never slept. After serving 11 months on his two-year mission, he was sent home. He had contracted hepatitis and continued to hear voices. Sending missionaries home early is typically not done, unless it is deemed absolutely critical for the health of the missionary. Bruce was briefly hospitalized for psychiatric evaluation, and he received treatment for his hepatitis. But while there, he still continued to have his visions. Shortly after he was released, he headed to Brigham Young University, a reputable school owned by the LDS Church. Young LDS students go there with the hope of finding their eternal companion. That's an LDS term for husband or wife. Bruce majored in Spanish and minored in political science. He also met Margaret Brigitte Erickson, a fellow student at BYU from Sweden. Margit was born on November 4, 1939 in Sweden and was converted to the church at the age of 18 before attending BYU. She was described as soft-spoken and easily influenced. Bruce proclaimed to Margit's roommate that he had a revelation that the two, he and Margit, were supposed to get married. Margit is said to have been flattered by Bruce's proposal. He was a good-looking and charming man. She dropped out of school and the two were married in December of 1961. By the time Bruce graduated in 1965, the couple had two children and the family moved to Salt Lake City. Around 1969, Bruce claimed to have had a revelation saying that he was going to be the next prophet of the church. In 1970, the standing prophet of the LDS church, David O. McKay, passed away. Bruce was sure he was going to be named as his replacement and was severely depressed when the role was handed to Joseph Fielding Smith. Bruce had been in contact with church officials during this time. He professed to be God, the Holy Ghost, or the Messiah and demanded all tithes from members be paid to him. Bruce was then excommunicated from the church for apostasy, as was Margit. Shortly after this, he grew out his hair and let his beard grow long and legally changed his name to Emmanuel David and Margit's name to Rachel. Emmanuel was the clear patriarch of the family, and Rachel dutifully took on her role as a subservient wife. Emmanuel David formed a cult of about 13 followers, many of whom were family members with some being friends. Almost all had been excommunicated from the church and took the surname of David. Emmanuel continued to claim he was the Messiah and taught his followers to refer to him as such. At various times he referred to himself as the Holy Ghost God and Jesus all wrapped up into one. 
He truly seemed to believe this about himself, and so did the family and his followers. Emmanuel acquired a heavy, finely crafted longsword that he carried with him at all times, claiming it was his holy weapon. It was inscribed with the words Holiness to the Lord on one side, and David on the other, next to a Star of David. Emmanuel moved his cult along with his family to a small town called Manti, named after a city in the Book of Mormon. Like most false prophets, Emmanuel was charismatic and was able to convince some prominent people in Manti to donate to his cult. During their stay in Manti, the Davids opened up a knife crafting business that was run by the cult members, which is one way they supported themselves. The members also became adept at scamming people into donating money for supposed family emergencies. These scams caught the attention of the FBI and David and his followers were under investigation for wire fraud. In 1971, the David family and his devout group of followers moved out of Manti and took residence in hotels across different states, mostly in the West, leaving unpaid bills in their wake. They made their way back to Salt Lake City in 1977 and moved into the International Dunes Hotel in downtown Salt Lake City. By this time, the Davids had seven children who had all been given biblical names. Rachel born in 1962, Elizabeth 1963, Joshua 1968, Deborah 1969, Joseph 1970, David 1971, and Rebecca 1972. Their given names were Marcy, Eva, Frank, Anthony, Deborah, Rebecca, and Charles Bruce. But they all too carried the surname of David. The David children were homeschooled by Rachel and had never been to a public school. Lessons taught were reading, art, math, and Bible study. They were described by those who were able to see them as clean, neat, literate, and well-behaved. The boys wore their hair in braids like their father. The girls' hair was long and parted in the middle, pulled away from their face by barrettes. They were never permitted to use the hotel swimming pool. Water is considered a place where the devil has a strong influence. There is speculation that this may be why. The Davids kept the children sheltered from the outside world and would only allow them to speak to others with Emmanuel's permission. Whenever the maids came in to clean their suites, the children were ushered into another room until the cleaning was complete. The Davids stayed in rooms 1105 and 1106. The hotel suites they lived in cost $90 a day and was paid daily with cash by Emmanuel with a crisp $100 bill. They would order food from expensive restaurants in the area. As Emmanuel had a big appetite and was a large man weighing about 300 pounds and standing six foot four, it was figured that the Davids needed about $300 a day to maintain their lifestyle. That's equivalent to about $1,200 in today's money. Emmanuel did not work and hadn't since 1965, except for an odd job here and there. The family's living expenses were being funded by its members, some selling their homes and belongings and handing the proceeds over to the Davids. Even prospective members would pay the privilege of belonging to this cult, with one such woman donating $25,000 to the Davids. Another devoted follower, who had been a member of the famed Tabernacle Choir at one time, conned some of those members and friends out of money to hand over to the David family. This cult member was convicted of wire fraud and spent five years in prison. He used the story of a paralyzed nine-year-old girl in need of money for medical expenses as the con. He pleaded guilty to charges, but in later years he denied being involved in any illegal activities. Needless to say, there was all manners of fraud and scams going on those years that never came fully to light. This all speaks to the effectiveness of Emmanuel's charm. Emmanuel David had friends outside the cult that helped him out as well, by loaning him money and use of their vehicles. One such friend was a man of means, who was a missionary companion of Emmanuel while in Uruguay. This man is still living, so I won't use his name as he has struggled throughout the years for giving Emmanuel cash and loans and just genuinely buying into Emmanuel's stories. This friend was under the impression that Emmanuel had access to money due to his extravagant lifestyle. Emmanuel really pulled one over on this friend and took advantage of his kindness. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? On July 31st, 1978, Emmanuel entered this friend's place of employment panicked and out of breath, stating that he needed to borrow his truck. The friend handed the keys to Emmanuel and off he drove, destination unknown to anyone but himself. On August 1st, a hiker discovered the body of Emmanuel David in the passenger seat of the truck. It rigged a garden hose from the exhaust pipe to the inside of the truck he had borrowed and used cloth to seal off any potential leaks. He had committed suicide. Officers arrived at the International Dune Hotel the next day to inform Rachel of her husband's death. The officer stated that she didn't seem shocked, just agitated and worried. She told the officers that her husband had been depressed and had a better place to go. 
She also added that she had no way of paying for his funeral. Rachel, who was wholly dependent financially on her husband, Emmanuel, must have felt desperate and at a loss as what to do next. It's said that she made a call to her family who lived in Denmark at the time. She spoke to the hotel manager that night and asked if he would work with her until she got her finances worked out. She even spoke to the delicatessen manager about the idea of enrolling her kids in school. At approximately 7.15 a.m. on August 2nd, 1978, Jim Bradley, the hotel manager, was standing at the front desk when his wife, who also helped manage the hotel, approached him and said, Jim, they're jumping off the balcony. Well, she said that Mr. David's, uh, you know, his death, he, he died for a reason that nobody would really understand, you know. Jim exited the hotel and went to the east side of the building where a crowd of onlookers was gathering. Witnesses that saw the whole event stated that Rachel David walked her kids to the railings of room 1105. There she pushed Joseph 8, David 7, and Rebecca 6 up over the railing. At least two of the younger children clung to Rachel before going over. After that, the other children, Rachel 15, Elizabeth 14, Joshua 13, and Deborah 9, stood on folding chairs that were stacked next to the railing and jumped without provocation from their mother. All the while this was happening, the crowd was yelling at Rachel to stop, but it was to no avail. After the children had gone over, Rachel stepped up and sat on the railing for about 30 seconds. The crowd was angry at what they had just witnessed and began chanting, Jump, bitch, jump. And that is exactly what she did. Few moments later. Six of the David family members landed on a canopy roof of the hotel coffee shop nine stories below, then bound to the sidewalk. Three fell the entire 11 stories onto the sidewalk. One of the boys ended up in the gutter. Witnesses said that the youngest daughter, Rebecca, desperately grabbed onto the railings and Rachel pried her fingers loose. This was confirmed when the autopsy was performed on her by the bruising on the tips of her fingers and broken fingernails. They were all taken to area hospitals where they were all pronounced dead upon arrival or shortly thereafter. Except one, Rachel, the oldest child of Rachel and Emmanuel David. Rachel was admitted to the shock and trauma unit of the LDS hospital. She was in a coma and doctors weren't sure if she was going to survive. She immediately went into surgery, where she was administered 21 units of blood. She uh, just literally uh, mangled both of her legs. Uh, all the bones in both of the legs were broken. She fell astraddle of something and she split her pelvis and uh, literally tore right up into the uh, abdominal cavity. About a week into her hospital stay, she was listed in stable condition, although she was still unconscious. After two weeks, her condition went from critical to serious. She was still in a coma. However, the doctors felt that she was gaining consciousness. After multiple surgeries to repair the damage from the fall to her broken body, she regained consciousness. Rachel was kept protected from the public, so little is known about what happened to her after she was released from the hospital. What is known is that she lived in a foster home for a time and has been in different care facilities in Salt Lake Valley throughout the years. She lived with her uncle Jacob David, who became her legal guardian and other cult members in Colorado until recently. While staying with them, she was not able to remember what happened that day. At one point, she stated to her uncle, I want to shove it all out. I want my family back. She still believes her father will return one day as God because he never lied to her. She has continued to try following the suicide order and has attempted to kill herself several times. She is now in a long-term care facility in Idaho. She now suffers from brain damage and is still in a wheelchair. <laughs> it is speculated the reason Emmanuel committed suicide was the loss of disciples, which resulted in less cash, the pending investigations, and unfulfilled prophecies. One fell prophecy was that California would fall into the ocean and that Salt Lake City would be consumed by fire. The David family was buried together in Taylorsville Memorial Park Cemetery in Salt Lake City. And as recently as 10 years ago, members of this call still remained and believed that Emmanuel would return to Earth as God. The suicide leap killed the mother and four of the children instantly. Three others were transported to hospitals where two of them died a short time later. Emmanuel David thought he could destroy the whole world if he concentrated hard enough. Emmanuel David, whose body was found on Monday, he died of by asphyxiation. Well, she said that Mr. David's, you know, his death, he, he died for a reason that nobody would really understand. Their act may have been carried out so that they could join him in what Rachel David called 
the next world. Look up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's the David family! Welcome to my channel.